Um, and the question of close communion, that's probably where we are, so let's talk about that. The very first question you encounter, is it close or is it closed? And I, I have talked to some people who get really upset about this and really, it's close, not closed. And they get all bent out of shape about it. Um, bottom line is, it doesn't really matter. I, in, the, in the early church, they probably called it closed communion or, you know, because that was just the way it was. We, we tried to um, call it close communion because, oh, that's not quite so offensive. But bottom line is it's going to be offensive however you call it, and so don't get worried about it. It's not that big of a deal. The name of it really doesn't matter. What we're describing when we talk about close or closed, and I guess I prefer closed just because it's nastier sounding, Closed communion, what we're talking about here is the fact that the altar is for those who believe like is taught at that altar, for people of like faith. And so for, it is for the community of believers. This is the celebration of the unity that they share. And the unity is, some, is more than just, yeah, we all believe in Jesus. Unity is in the unity of teaching, the unity of doctrine. And so we go back to our corpus doctrina idea, and we have the body of doctrine. It's the whole thing. And you can't just, you know, say, oh, we all believe in Jesus. We all have the same heart. That's nice. Well, what about everything else? And so what we're saying is, what Scripture teaches is, this communion, the Lord's Supper, is a celebration of the community of believers. And so those who are communing are in communion with each other. It's not just a one-on-one -on -one me and Jesus meal, even though in our American psyche we tend to think that way. We're the rugged individualist. It's just me and Jesus. Who cares about anybody else? I can get the sacrament. It's just me and Jesus. Well, that's not true. Because when you take Holy Communion, you're up there kneeling, and there is a whole bunch of people all around you. And everybody there at that rail, sharing that rail with you, and everybody who is sharing that cup with you and sharing that bread with you, they are all together with you in this celebration. And you should be celebrating the unity that you have. And so if you don't have unity with somebody, you don't act like you do. It's just that simple. That's what close communion means. And that's why we teach it. Now, in the, within the community, it becomes a great celebration of the unity that's there. If you're not part of the community... Well, yeah, it makes you feel kind of excluded. And Kolb says this really well. Lines of inclusion that surround a community are also, by, just by, by default, lines of exclusion. If the line of my doctrine includes all of us who all agree, well, the people who don't agree are now on the outside of that line. You can't help it. So if you're going to have something you confess, and if you confess that and it matters, that is by just immediately a line of demarcation. We all confess this. Someone who doesn't, well, they don't. That means they're not part of. It's just that simple. It's not that complicated. It's not that hard. The problem, of course, is that the people who are out here feel like, ooh, they're judging me. And, oh, they're saying they're better than I am. Or something's wrong with me. And that's not what we're saying. So, close communion actually has several aspects. Why do we do it? Well, the first one that everybody knows about, and it goes back to the, the mandicatio indignorum, is the fact that we want to do it for the protection of unbelievers. For the protection of unbelievers. Because if I don't recognize the body and blood of Christ, and I go up there and take the sacrament, is that good for me or bad for me? Bad for me. 1 Corinthians 11. So, that's the first reason, simply because we care. And that will go so far, people will say, oh, that's nice, okay, I like that. We're not going to hurt anybody. But now, I've got Uncle Jim and Aunt Mabel, who are visiting here from out of town, and they're Methodists. Can they come to communion with me, Pastor? Well, no, we have close communion. Well, yeah, but they're believers, so I don't have to worry about them getting hurt. They won't get hurt. They know it's the body and blood of Christ. And yeah, they're members of the Methodist Church, but... You know, they really believe like we do. They know it's really the body and blood of Christ because anybody who reads the Bible knows that. And they really believe like we do. They just go to that church because they like the music and stuff. But they're really like us. So they can commune, right, Pastor? Well, see, there's, we're not done. There's more to it. 
It's not just for the protection of unbelievers. It's also because of this idea of the celebration of unity. matter what was the elements of the sacrament. Yeah. He said he'd given his youth group Oreos and Coke. <coughs> yeah. He says that he hopes to do uh, beer and pizza someday. Yeah, yeah there's a name for guys like that. <laughs> yeah. Mm, it's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> Discretion forbids me from sharing it. All right. So uh, the celebration of unity. We are celebrating a unity that we have. It's not just like Hey, you know, anybody can come up here because we're, this is a unity that goes deeper than just, oh, I'll believe in Jesus. This is a celebration of the unity that we have in doctrine. That's a part of this, too. So what we would say is that Uncle uh, Aunt Mabel and uh, whoever I had, Uncle whatever was he, it's great to have you here. And I'm glad that you're a faithful member of your congregation. And I'm glad that you're following Christ. That's great. Keep doing that. And when you're home at your congregation, please, by all means, go take communion. But when you're here, you have a different faith than we do, a different confession than we do. And it really isn't appropriate for you to commune here. Because when I come to your church, I won't commune at yours either. Oh, but we want you to. That doesn't matter. I wouldn't because we're just disagreeing. This teaching is not a new one. Close communion has been the teaching of the church from the very beginning. That was always what was taught. In the early church, you know what the practice was? We know this from the, the, from the Didache, which is a second century document. We know from, there, from that document that in the early church, when it came time to celebrate communion, they would all get together and they would have their church service. When it came time to celebrate the sacrament, they would have the exchange of peace, the kiss of peace. But before that, they would dismiss from the building anybody who had not yet been baptized. All the catechumens were dismissed. I might even be somebody who is studying the catechism, learning to become, you know, waiting to be baptized and studying and preparing. And when it came time for the sacrament, I was dismissed. I couldn't be there. Now, you talk about close communion. That's close communion. It'd be like us standing up in church saying, okay, everybody who's not a member of this congregation is now asked to please leave. And they all leave, and now we celebrate communion. That's what they did. And this has been the practice of the church all through the ages. If you go over to the Cathedral Basilica over in the central west end today, and if you're new to St. Louis, you don't know about it yet, sometime go over there and check it out. It's worth a 45-minute wandering around. It's got the largest collection of mosaics in the world. It's right here just down the road a bit. It's worth checking out. It's one of those take your parents here when they come to visit on, you know, one of those tourist spots. It's worth checking out on your way to the brewery. Um, <coughs> and so, so you... Um, Check out the Central West End, and when you walk into that cathedral, there will be a little card that will say there, we welcome you to our cathedral. If you're here for Mass, that's great, but um, don't take communion. It's just for Catholics. They practice close communion, and they always have. So, close communion is not meant to be exclusionary. It's just a recognition of the fact that there's a difference. And we're just acknowledging that. Now, the problem is people find this patently offensive. Something's wrong with me. So we have to be careful to tell people, nothing's wrong with you. You just have a different profession. That's all. And I'm not judging your faith. I'm not saying you're going to hell. I'm not saying you're a bad Christian. I'm just saying you're different. Let's just call it like it is and quit playing silly games here. So that's why the practice of close communion. It's not a popular one because it seems to be judging people. But it is the practice of the church. And to be able to stand up in front of the church and say, it's up to you where you stand with Jesus, you decide, is missing the point of the sacrament. This is the congregation sacrament. The sacrament is celebrating together. This is not just a me and Jesus thing. It is the whole community thing. And the community is celebrating the unity and the, uh, the confession that is there that they all share. And if you don't share it, you really don't belong at that altar. It's just that easy. So, Defining community then is just the congregation. Are you can like are you defining community as like the Lutheran church. I would say the community starts with the congregation. And that's where I would do it. Now you can draw it a little wider, but I think ultimately it is that congregation, which is why I think it is good practice. Even if you are an LCMS individual and you're in another LCMS congregation, if that's not your home congregation, it's good practice to go and talk to the pastor. No, that's what I do. If that's right. Okay, just that's to, right. Just to make sure. That's okay. right. Because you're letting him know that you're there. He knows who you are. Now, when he gives you the host, he knows what you're doing. He knows where you are. And that's just appropriate because that community is celebrating it. 
You're part of, you're now you're asking to be part of that community, essentially, is what you're asking, which is a good thing to ask. That's, that's appropriate. I mean, I don't like my church put a disclaimer in the bulletin, but what are churches that don't do that? How do they deal with this? Well, there are, like I said, this, the practice on this is all over the map right now. And, you know, I can stand up here today and say, boom, this is it, and spout it out, and we're all done. The fact is, there are pastors all over the place on this thing, and there are a lot of congregations that are just scared to death to try to practice close communion, don't want to do it. It's unloving, it's not nice, it's judgmental, and who are we to decide? And all the rigmarole you hear all the time. And so they don't do it. And there are some who openly practice open communion, which is, you all come up here. If you believe in Jesus, come on up. But see, what that does is it really denigrates the sacrament, and it also diminishes the fact that we are unique here. And it really, what it does is it makes doctrine look like un, it's not important. And do the people in the congregation get that message? Yes. I've seen it in action. If the congregation that practices open communion begins to have a very dim view of doctrine, it really doesn't matter. We all believe in Jesus. What a difference does it make? And that's detrimental, big time. If you don't believe that yet, you will as you see things go. I mean, you start letting doctrine go, you're losing everything. It's back to that body. What kind of body do you want to be? Healthy? Piecemeal? What do you want? And to just say we all believe in Jesus just does not cut it. Jeremy. Well, essentially, Jesus did close communion. It was his group of community. Yes. Yeah. He didn't invite everybody else that was following That's him. true. That's true. Yeah. It was for that fellowship, that community. That's right. I agree. John? Um, there are special problems, though. I come from Florida. Oh, yeah. Um, Let's say no more. <laughs> my hometown... 150,000 to 200,000 residents, peak of season over a million. Uh -huh. Only eight and ten people in church on a Sunday in January or February are from somewhere else. Yep. We make it very clear that we're an LCMS congregation. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed some of the Wisconsin Senate people that come won't take communion That's because right. they've been told not to anywhere that isn't Wisconsin. That's right. But eight out of ten people there are either only members of the church kind of part of the year or they're not really members of the church at all. Mm -hmm. Our church, but they are LCMS. Yeah. Um, well, if they're LCMS, I still think it would be appropriate for that first time that I show up in that congregation, I'll go talk to the pastor and say, yeah, I'm a snowbird and I'm here for the winter and I'll be, be, I'll be attending your church. I'd like to take communion. And he'll say, fine. Or even just make a phone call. I mean, it's not that hard. And to me, that's the appropriate thing to do. And I know there are congregations like that. And that's fine. That's not a problem. There are other exceptions that make it, that can do get tougher. See, ultimately, also we do believe in pastoral discretion. Is it possible for a pastor to sometimes commune somebody who is not LCMS? Yes. But those are what we would say are discretionary, rather emergency situations. And Aunt Mabel, who's visiting from out of town, I don't think qualifies. Would you actually turn somebody away yeah. who came to the communion rail? Yeah, I might. I've never seen that happen. I know, but I might. Well, I, I, have, I have had the conversations with people out in the narthex. You know, we're visiting, we'd like to take communion, well, what's your situation? And while well, we're members of such and such a church and it's not LCMS, I'd say we need to talk more. And I know this, you would like to take communion, I'd like you to have it, and ultimately I hope we, we'd like to do that, but we need to talk a little more before this happens. And I'll, I'll put them off. Or I'll just tell somebody, no, you really don't belong at this altar. And, and see, people say, well, I'm just there in, in name only. Well, then why are you there? I mean, you know, there's, you just got to deal with these kinds of things. So there are places for pastoral discretion, but like I said, these are rather rare. And just because they happen to be visiting, I don't think rises to the level of pastoral discretion. That's just a cop-out to be lazy. Pastoral discretion is where you've got somebody who, the one, the one time I did it in my ministry was where I had a gal in my congregation was dying of leukemia. Her dad was a member of my congregation. Her mother was Roman Catholic because she was, I don't know, Panamanian born or something. So Roman Catholic. And I was in their home, and the daughter was on her final days, and I was giving the sacrament to the daughter and the father, and the mom was standing right there. No one else was around. And I said, would you like to receive the sacrament too with your family? And she said, I would love to. And so I communed her. And I thought it was the appropriate thing to do at that time. Now, someone else, you can disagree with me and say, ah, I shouldn't have, shouldn't have done it. Well, that, okay, but see, that was my pastoral discretion. And I thought that situation warranted it the one time I did it. Okay. Questions? Well, it's not a question, a comment. Uh, my relatives come visit a lot. They go to church with us. They're all uh -huh. Baptist. I tell them ahead of time. Okay. I, I, I quiz them. What do you believe? What do you not believe? Yeah. Everything else. And then yeah. I say, sorry, you will not take communion. <laughs> my sister, oh, What? 
they still come to visit us. So. That's good. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, that's, that's, that's great. And so you've given a, a pretty clear message. There is a difference here. And you're not being nasty about it. And you don't have to be judgmental. It's just there's, there are differences. And you see, it really doesn't do any good either to say, do you believe in the real presence? What does that mean? And, yeah, I believe in the real presence. You see, it's bigger than that even. Just because I'm baptized, I recognize the real presence, does not mean I'm a, I'm a worthy communicant. I might be a worthy communicant at my home congregation, but am I going to be communing here, or you have a different confession than I do? No, because we are celebrating our confession here. That's how we do it. Next up, Tom. Well, you know, jumping off the, what, what Aaron was saying, uh, you, know, you talk about some churches, they have these communion statements, and some of them are just, mm-hmm. like, very short. Oh, know? yeah. Some of them are you vague know? as gall get out. They yeah. mean nothing. But, but I've also seen where some congregations are doing this, like, dissertation that they put, mm-hmm. in, that they put in their bulletin that basically says... You know, if you if you believe this, yeah. then you're okay. Yeah, see, I don't even like that because I think that's missing the point. I think the point is we are we are celebrating a, a communion together. We are this unity in Christ in this place centered around our Lord and around our confession of His truth. That's what we're doing here, and it's it's not just a matter of check off the boxes, agreed, agreed, agreed. Good, I get to go up there. It is more than that. And I know what they're intending. They're trying to do the right thing. But, see, it's not a matter of just checklists. It's, it's kind of like, well, what do I got to do? Well, you got to do this and this. Well, anything else? No, I guess that's enough. That, you're missing the point. Yeah, that's, that's not the point. Okay? Aaron? I'll say that when people come up to the, the table, you know, to take communion that aren't part of the community, yeah. the pastor just give them some kind of general blessing like you would a child or yeah. anything else yeah. that comes up. So. Yeah, yeah, you might do that if you're not sure. So you're not excluding them. You're offering them a blessing. I've seen congregations that are very articulate in saying that. And I don't know adults who go up on a regular basis, like, you know, spouses, uh, you know, who are married but they're not part of that congregation, will go up for the blessing on a regular basis. They know they're not going to get the sacrament, and they understand, but they still want the blessing. So they feel a part of that, and that's, I'm okay with that. Not a problem. Yeah. John? How do they deal with this then at a church that might have 3,000 commanders? That gets really tough, which is an argument for why we shouldn't have big churches. <laughs> There's, I, I, I actually, I'm becoming a stronger believer in that all the time. Church can get too big, and then you need to make it smaller. I know, and all the big church pastors fight with me and argue with me like that. Like they take great offense at that. But I, I'm becoming more and more sympathetic to that idea. I think there comes a point where church just gets too big, and the right thing to do is become a daughter church and split it off. But that's another topic. <laughs> yeah, I feel like people aren't real fond of that thought. <laughs> so the self-examination questions at the beginning of the hymnal? Or 300? Questions for examination on page 313. Are those mm-hmm. for the community then? Yeah. Okay, so they're not for a pastor to say, well, if you want to take communion, read these. No, they're not a checklist to see if you're if you're in. Heard that. So yeah, that yeah, they're not a checklist to see if you're in. They are for your benefit, for your own personal preparation, so that you are a receiving the sacrament to your benefit. You know, the idea of a worthy re- communicant, but n- more than worthy, it's one who is receiving it to the full benefit. That's why Luther drew up those questions, the twenty questions. Okay, another one. Uh, to answer John's questions, what I've seen done in a lot of organizations <coughs> I've been in, in, mil- in the military, I've been in a lot of different. If it's a large congregation, the pastor will teach the elders what they need to ask, what they need to talk with the people yeah. about. Yeah, so there's a many of our be in there, either talk to the pastor or the elders, and the elders are easily identified. They've got a big name on sign on them or something. Says on the elders. <laughs> well, they're stationed around the narthex in a certain place, right. whatever. And yeah. the people will go and talk with them. Yeah. Then they will go and talk to the pastor and say, these people, and point them out. So that when they do go to the rail, pastor doesn't say, who are you? Yeah, you can do this. And the surprising thing is, if you're a pastor of a large congregation, you do start to, you know who people are. You do. I mean, if you're there, I mean, not right away. It takes time. But eventually, it's amazing how well you get to know your people. And who is, and when you see a new face, you know it's a new face. It, it happens. You can, you can do it better than you think you might. Okay, Chris? I was going to say, my dad's a pastor in, in South Texas. Uh-huh. And he... He, he runs all over the place with this thing. He, he's got the paragraph at the opening of the bulletin, uh-huh. um, just saying if you, if you don't, this is what we believe. This is what we're doing. If you don't agree with this, or you don't know about it, or you're just not familiar with it, just talk to it or go to an usher, and he'll point you to an elder and this yeah. and that. And he's done the training of the elders, as yeah. you were saying. And then before communion, he turns around and like I've been to service where services where he just runs straight into communion. But he, he stops, turns around, and pauses and says, this is, we're about to do this if you're not a member, if you don't know what's going on, please talk to someone before you come up. That's here. great. 
And then I think that's appropriate. And then there's the blessing. Yeah. yeah. See, the pastor will have a sense of who's there, you know, and stuff. And see, this is this is the most nerve wracking at Christmas and Easter. I mean, the very times when you really want to have an excellent service, but you have faces like crazy. And so I think it's appropriate at those services, especially, to make some sort of announcement and make it real clear. But see, that's the very time the pastors don't want to because they don't want to ruin the mood or something. But I mean, you've got to be you got to be faithful. I mean, there are creative ways to do it without being nasty. It's what? <laughs> I, think, I think it's most appropriate when, I, when I've seen it and yeah. experienced. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, 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 can, it works. It works. I agree with that. It's good.